Great. Well, I think we can get started. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, uh, this is yet another event in our series this week on Indigenous knowledge and sustainability. Um, this is a fantastic program. I hope if you have missed some of the previous talks that you go back and check them out on the recordings. And this is something that's been uh, set up by a broad collaborative inst of institutions here in St. Louis that include the Catherine M. Booter Center for American Indian Studies at Washington University in St. Louis, the Whitney R. Harris Center at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, the St. Louis Zoo, the Native American Studies Program at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, and the Center for Spirituality and Sustainability at SIUE. It also includes um, us here at the Missouri Botanical Garden, where we are now in person. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Robbie Hart. I'm director of the William L. Brown Center here at the Garden, uh, which is a center of excellence dedicated to the study of useful plants, understanding the relationships between humans, plants, and their environment, the conservation of plant species, and the preservation of traditional knowledge for the benefit of future generations. Um, with this mission, as you might imagine, I'm especially excited about uh, this talk and indeed the whole week's uh, sessions. Joining us today are Elizabeth Hoover and Devin uh, Mahisua. Um, Elizabeth, uh, Dr. Hoover will speak first. Uh, she's associate professor at the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research focuses on Native American environmental health and food sovereignty movements. She's the author of The River is in Us, Fighting Toxins in a Mohawk Community, University of Minnesota Press, which is an ethnographic exploration of the Akwesani Mohawks response to Superfund contamination and environmental health research. Her forthcoming book, From Garden Warriors to Good Seeds, Indigenizing the Local Food Movement, explores Native American farming and gardening projects around the country, the successes and challenges faced by these organizations, the ways in which participants define and envision concepts like food sovereignty, the importance of heritage seeds, the role of native chefs in the food sovereignty movement, and convergences between food sovereignty and anti-pipeline and anti-mining movements. Dr. Hoover has also published articles about food sovereignty, environmental reproductive justice in Native American communities, the cultural impact of fish advisories in Native communities, tribal citizen science, and health social movements. She co-edited uh, with Devin Mahisua, Indigenous Food Sovereignty in the United States, Restoring Cultural Knowledge, Protecting Environments, and Regaining Health, which received the 2020 Daniel F. Austin Award presented by the Society for Economic Botany. And um, I will turn it over to her now to talk about these topics. Good afternoon from Berkeley, California, where I'm sitting here on Ohlone territory. I moved here recently to become an associate professor of environmental science policy and management at UC Berkeley in the Society and Environment Division. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about that um, project that Robbie mentioned in the beginning, the Garden Warriors to Good Seeds, a particular angle of it, thinking about how farming, gardening, and food sovereignty all fit together in native communities. So to just kind of start off with, um, you know, in thinking about definitions of food sovereignty, the self-described peasant organization La Via Campesina has brought together people, land-based people from around the world to think about how they want to define food sovereignty broadly and in their own communities. And one of the definitions that they came up with out of the Declaration of Nileni in 2007 and a gathering that they held in Mali was the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and the right to define their own food and agriculture systems. And this is a little bit different from food security, which is, you know, are you consistently getting enough calories? Um, and also food justice, which has been an important movement, which has wanted to ensure equal access to safe, healthy food and make assurances that the workers within the food system are treated fairly and also wants people to really account for the value of food in relation to the self-determination of their communities. Um, so essentially food security is, are you getting enough food on a regular basis? Food justice is, do you have equal access to this system that it kind of exists there for everyone? And food sovereignty is saying, look, we don't just want equality within this current system, but having control over your own system. 
And then on top of that, indigenous folk scholars like Deborah McGregor, Kyle White, um, Devin Mehiswa, and many others have written about um, an indigenous food sovereignty specifically, saying that we, you know, we need to really recognize that the social, cultural, and economic relationships that underlie community food sharing and that need to be nurtured, and the sacred responsibilities to nurture those relationships to land-based food and political systems. And Don Morris has also written a number of really great essays and thinking about the pillars that exist that um, define indigenous food sovereignty so specifically. So really valuing those sacred responsibilities and relationships that people have to the food itself and to each other as part of food producing. So this is the whirlwind, you know, why is it that native people are fighting for food sovereignty right now? Um, you know, it starts with very intentional destruction of food systems from the 17th century onwards. So for Haudenosaunee people uh, on the, the East Coast, the French coming through in the 1600s and intentionally burning cornfields as a way of weakening um, people politically. And then General Sullivan being sent forth by George Washington to lay waste to their settlements. Um, and this was in the 1790s, saying, you know, intentionally go and burn up people's food systems as a way of politically weakening tribes. There was the intentional destruction of buffalo herds um, across the plains to weaken plains tribes. There was the destruction of Navajo um, crops and corn and um, orchards and sheep herds, again, um, as a way of subjecting people to, to punishment who did not um, kind of immediately bow to the Western government's orders. There was the theft of land and relocation. So you had the Trail of Tears in the 1830s, relocating tribes from the Southeast out to Oklahoma, um, and then other tribes that were relocated from all across the country to Indian Territory, who then had to completely readapt to a brand new food system, um, often who didn't have the chance to pack up all of their seeds and gardening tools along the way. The Allotment Act further shrunk the land bases that tribes had access to to produce food. Um, the boarding school system forcibly took kids from their communities and re-educated them and how the um, kind of Western assimilated system thought people should be um, producing food, growing food, relating to food. The Bureau of Indian Affairs pushed uh, Western farming methods and hybrid seeds from the late 19th century onward, which really impacted kind of the access to heirloom seeds in communities and dry land farming and other kind of more original ways of, of growing. Um, and then we have issues of climate change, cross-contamination with genetically modified seeds, um, and a lack of access to land and tools in some communities. So some of the impacts of altered food systems prior to um, 1940, there were very few cases of type 2 diabetes. It's now the seventh leading cause of death for Native people. Um, the U.S. Indian Health Service says that the death rate for American Indians because of diabetes is 249% greater than other American communities. Um, and then there are economic impacts. So the White Earth Land Recovery Project did a survey among their community members and found that $8 million a year was spent by their community on food, $7 million of which was spent off reservation. Um, so, you know, these are kind of the depressing statistics, some of the depressing history um, but what's important to remember is, you know, how are Native communities responding to this, um, in many cases through really getting these gardening and farming projects going. And so I really started thinking about this. I grew up on a little farm in upstate New York, um, but really started thinking about the political movement that is food sovereignty and reclaiming heirloom seeds when I was living on the Akwesasne Mohawk Reservation. I'm working with a group called Genehio and Gwaya Dohage, or We Are Planting Good Seeds. Um, which has been working to try to get people back into farming and gardening and seed saving and producing food. Um, and so as part of this, you know, thinking about how do other communities do this kind of work that Gunahio was doing in Akwesasne. Um, so that led me on this kind of epic adventure. I started going to these different food sovereignty summits and meeting people around the country who were doing similar kinds of farming and gardening projects. And that in 2014 led me on this kind of epic road trip, 20,000 miles around the country, where I went to 39 different sites and uh, did 52 interviews with people and uh, recorded some farm tours and really got to, to know the kinds of things that people were working on. I also interviewed 30 different seed keepers um, and 
a bunch of chefs as well as part of that kind of that part of the project and had the opportunity to go to a bunch of different food sovereignty summits and dinners um, and also participants who were engaging in anti-pipeline and anti-mining work to see how that also fit into food sovereignty. And that led to this blog, um, gardenwarriorsgoodseeds.com, because people really wanted to know what are other people working on? Um, you know, so this was an opportunity because books take a long time, articles take a long time. The blog was an opportunity to share some of the photos that I was taking and the interviews that I was doing with people. And some of the different um, questions that I was asking, I'm wondering if I have the right presentation here. Yes, okay. I thought I cut out some of these. I was trying to really keep it um, to just a half an hour because boy, I can talk about this stuff all day, let me tell you. But these were some of the different questions and I won't really get into this here. Um, but you know, how do you define food sovereignty? What are some of the successes and challenges? You know, where do you get your funding? Um, do you see yourself as part of the broader food movement? And what are the recommendations you have for other organizations like yours? And I'm gonna get into more of those today. Um, but in thinking about how are people defining food sovereignty, one of the biggest aspects of all the definitions that people gave me who were working on all these different projects was the importance of access to food. So, you know, our, how do you increase access to culturally relevant food? Um, how do you make sure that people either have the knowledge and the tools to grow it themselves or that it's available at affordable prices or through programs like theirs? There was also a real focus on independence. Um, so being able to produce enough food for your community without outside interference from governments or other multinational companies. Um, and we saw this, especially during the pandemic, when suddenly the grocery stores in a lot of communities were empty and the shelves were empty and everyone was panicking because um, those supply lines were disrupted and people really said, oh my goodness, we need to figure out how to become more independent as a community so that we don't have to be so reliant on all of these outside entities and you don't have to suddenly be faced with empty shelves. And thinking about um, how can individuals and individual families become more independent? How can communities, um, but also as a, a tribe to be self-sufficient? Um, food sovereignty entails local food. Um, so developing your local food system, making it so that your food doesn't have to travel so far. Um, you know, so cutting down on the carbon footprint of your, your food, but also you know, ensuring a, a, a greater freshness in that way and taking care of the local land where food was grown and then also supporting some of those local growers. And then thinking about wild food. So eating where you're from as your ancestors did and whether that's berries, roots, wild rice, um, hunting, fishing for some people. Food sovereignty also entails sustainability and people define that in a variety of ways. So it's about sustaining the environment that produces your food, treating your soil differently than people who looked to their kind of conventional farming neighbors. Um, they didn't see them as treating their soluble and soil in this sustainable way. Um, thinking seven generations ahead, how are these projects going to be leaving behind healthy land for those generations, but also be set up in such a way that the projects will still be sustaining for those generations. So making sure that youth were involved and getting excited about it, um, that it wasn't just one particular generation working on each of these projects and utilizing these ancestral traditional values that maintain the local environment. And then health, you know, I mentioned some of those grim statistics at the beginning of the talk that really people felt that the production and consumption of traditional foods would help prevent some of these illnesses that are prevalent in indigenous communities like diabetes and heart disease and these other metabolic disorders. Um, and then also, so there's the, the health of the individual humans and, and ensuring that through access to healthy food, but also thinking about what in the interview that I did with Melissa Nelson, she defined it as eco-cultural health. So thinking about the health of the land and the people are inextricably linked. So when the land is not healthy, the people are not healthy and vice versa. And then um, because these were indigenous farming and gardening groups, um, food sovereignty really for them focused on culture specifically. So traditional foods have cultural meaning and context that's important to maintain. So it's not just about like, let's just grow all the kale that we can, but making sure that the foods that are very specific to um, ceremonial uses to cultural purposes are what's being planted. 
um, recognizing that a decline in access to traditional food led to culture and language loss. And then conversely, part of cultural and spiritual recovery is food recovery. And thinking about um, the ways that creation stories are connected with food. So for Haudenosaunee people, the corn, beans, and squash that are so important um, for traditional dishes and for uh, maintaining health are connected to um, the grave of Sky Woman's daughter who produced these important crops. Um, and many other communities have uh, creation stories that reflect the where foods have come from and, and people's relatedness to those foods. So thinking about corn as biological and spiritual nourishment, as Roberto Nutt Lewis described it, or as Winona LaDuke called it, the cosmogenealogy of food. So the ways that people are um, related in these stories to those food crops. And thinking about the importance of naming traditional foods. Um, so one of the folks that I interviewed, Stephanie with the Muskogee Food Sovereignty Initiative, said, well, we've got this pumpkin, and everybody calls it Indian pumpkin, and it's, you know, it's delicious, everybody likes eating it. But our ancestors wouldn't have called it Indian pumpkin, all the pumpkins were Indian pumpkins. So, you know, her, she was really um, seeking to try to Go back to remembering the original names for those food sources and reconnecting with them in that way. And then because I was specifically looking at farming and gardening food sovereignty projects, there's a, a growing and increasing interest and focus on continuing and revitalizing the use of traditional heirloom seeds. So in some communities, those seeds have always been there. People have always used them. And in other cases, people are um, seeking out some of those lost seed relatives and working to bring them home and get them back into the gardens and feeling a, a need to reconnect to those seeds because uh, they were developed by ancestors and because they were developed specifically for the land that we're working on. So in thinking about different levels of food sovereignty on an individual level, it's the right and responsibility over where your food comes from, what you're eating, what you're putting into your mouth. Um, on a community level, the need to make sure that the whole community is getting enough to eat and is self-sufficient, but also thinking about different kinds of communities as not just the human beings that you see yourself as related to, but also working on a reciprocal relationship between human, animal, plant, bird, fish communities. And then on a political level, um, you know, thinking about how are tribal governments ensuring that people have enough to eat, are passing policies to support local food producers on their territories, are working to protect habitat and ensure access to land for people who are working to produce food, um, fighting federal policies that are not supportive of local food system, and maintaining treaty rights that were signed by ancestors specifically to ensure access to foods. So some cool stuff, as I uh, have very thoughtfully labeled it here at some of the different farm projects. Um, you know, at the Red Willow Farm in Taos, there is this biomass furnace that helps to you know, just burn up scrap wood that's around that then pipes hot air into these greenhouses and it pipes it into the ground to warm the roots. So I thought that was very cool. And then there are also solar panels there. So thinking about how can these farms be run sustainably and not just um, off of electricity where possible. There were some really neat do-it-yourself greenhouses that I saw on some of the farms. So here's George Toy at Nambe Pueblo who uh, created this greenhouse for $1,300 with materials that he had around and kind of what he could get. Um, and he has produced thousands of pounds of produce out of this greenhouse. Or at Taos County Economic Development Corporation, they created wheelchair-friendly beds for the Not Forgotten Outreach, which is a, a veterans program. So, um, you know, adapting the beds to make sure that they were accessible to everyone. There were some aquaponics projects along the way. So especially in a place where they're like, well, if we just spray water out there on the ground, it evaporates quickly. So kind of keeping it inside in these aquaponics projects and trying to recycle water in that way. And then, you know, trying to get some fish out of it at the same time. Uh, there were a number of programs that work to connect language and gardening. I was thinking about how can you connect educational programs and gardening programs at the UC language program, the director Richard Ground said, you know, gardening is the perfect way of learning language because you're saying what you're doing and it's very repetitive. Um, the youth garden at Wajupi, which is a Shakopee garden in Minnesota, um, they had lots of little stones around that the youth created to um, partner their language lessons along with gardening lessons. The Equizesne Freedom School is a immersion school and the youth there are taught in the Mohawk language and the uh, curriculum is structured around the growing cycle. And so it's really kind of working to connect 
um, gardening and planting and math and science and language all together. And then you can see some signs that were put up around the, the Nambe Pueblo Youth Garden as well. Um, another way of combining programs with gardening was the vocational rehab programs that some people um, had set up. And so one of the examples is the Nisqually Community Garden here. Um, and it was a way for people who are in recovery, who are needing to um, build up their resumes, who've kind of been out of the workforce for a bit, to be in a healthy environment with other people who were working to be clean and sober and to be learning about food at the same time. So it was an important way of creating this healthy environment in a multitude of different ways. And then because there's a lot of indigenous folks in cities as well, there've been a number of urban indigenous gardens popping up. Um, you know, Minneapolis has got a few, the Little Earth Urban Farm, and then the Meshkiki Gitagan Garden, which is now um, being run by the natives, the North American traditional indigenous food systems. Um, but thinking about creative ways of utilizing space um, and keeping urban indigenous folks connected to their traditional foods at the same time. And then some permaculture courses that were incorporated into some of these farming and gardening projects. So the Hopi Tutsqua permaculture courses, you know, out on um, the mesas there, it's very dry. They don't get a lot of rain up there. And so they did some really clever lasagna bed gardening to um, amend the soils and help it to hold in water better. And then also the, the youth there learn about um, adobe and cob building and gray water design system. So working on creatively using, you know, water in your environment. And then communities have been setting up kind of creative ways of protecting seeds as well. So indigenous seed banks, Tesuke Pueblo has an amazing cob building that kind of goes underground as well. And in the inside there's straw bales and tires and all kinds of other things. Um, but inside, you know, it maintains this nice even temperature and is able to protect the seeds in that way. And then also the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network is another resource for um, helping Indigenous communities who want to learn more about seed saving and seed exchanges and, and building these kind of seed banks for their own communities. There are a number of farm to plate systems as well. So Tahana Atam Community Action, um, the restaurant has since closed, but really there was an effort to connect the gardens that were run by the program to a restaurant that was serving that food. Um, similarly, Dream of Wild Health in Minnesota, the youth learned from planting the seeds in the ground to taking care of those plants, harvesting, making lunch every day, and then also selling at the farmer's market. So it was really a way of connecting that entire process of producing food, consuming food, sharing food with others. Um, the Cheyenne River Youth Project similarly has the garden where the youth are working and then the Kia Cafe where the produce from that garden um, goes on tables for the community's farmer's market, but also into dishes for people to come and buy there as well. And then the, um, the Shakopee Wajupi garden also goes to the local grocery store and a TSA, the tribally supported agriculture. So similar to a community supported agriculture. Again, a way of getting that produce from the farm out to community members to help ensure access that way. And then Janhinkwa in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Oneida farm um, is kind of, I think one of the, the largest and best established products and they have a cannery there. So they produce lots of white corn and they're able to turn it into um, the soup products there in the cannery and then have it on the shelves. And it's, uh, people consume a lot more white corn in that community than in other places because it's so easily accessible in that way because the cannery is able to process it for people. So some of the um, advice that people, um, when I ask them, okay, now that you have you know, been working on these garden projects for a while, what kind of advice? So if there are people out there in the audience right now who are thinking of starting their own community-based farming and gardening projects, um, they said, look to others who have done this, go to conferences, travel to other sites, you know, phone up people who have these established projects. Don't try to reinvent the wheel or repeat mistakes that others have made already. Um, Another bit of advice, it learn from your land. I think often people are like, well, I'm, my garden is going to be this shape and I'm going to put it where I want it. And I'm just going to beat the land in submission to do what I want it to. Um, and people advise like, no, learn how water moves on your land. The big pine permaculture project. They said, you know, they watch for a few years to see how to shape the swales and where to plant the fruit trees based on where the water wanted to be. Um, learn what grows well in your climate, in your region. Don't assume you can just grow something because you want to, but because it, it might not do well um, if it's not designed for your climate. And this is where 
heirloom seeds kind of fit in well as well. Um, and anticipate your pests. So, you know, uh, Gloria said, put up the fence before the deer get in. <laughs> so, you know, kind of visiting with your neighbors and finding out what some of the greatest pests are, one way to, to do that. Um, and engage the community early and often in these projects. Um, so people have recommended a developing relationship with the people you intend to serve and get that community buy-in from the beginning, not after you've built up the project um, and provide an open environment for people to learn and provide input. Um, it was a don't give up, you know, there will be hard times and failures. Don't give up. Try again next year. Sometimes it takes time for the community to want to join and buy in. Um, you know, don't be discouraged and be consistent. Just keep coming back. I, I put a sad picture of one of my squashes um, there that just, you know, that was one of the years in the Gunahio garden that just got hit by vine borers and everything else. But we just kept trying, kept planting. Um, another bit of advice was, you know, just enough. This is, I put uh, George's field here because he said, you know, start small, start with what you have. Don't try to start too big and then fail epically and people will be really discouraged, but, but just enough, start small and then build your way up from there. Pick your locally important cultural crop. Um, they're saying if you're trying to take it to, you know, get the community really excited about it or take it to market, don't grow what everybody else is already growing, but find an important food to your culture that other producers aren't already producing in great quantities. Um, and then focus on those native plants and those heirloom varieties. And incorporate culture. So, you know, Milo and others suggested through um, ceremonies, through activities, through having culturally important plants um, to incorporate culture into gardening and farming and the, the programs that you're having. And that helps to provide a, a center, a heart for the project. Others advise you know, incorporating youth and elders, that elders provide the information you need and the youth need to hear it. Um, and elders are encouraged by having the opportunity to um, be able to speak with, with youth in these ways. And model the behavior you're trying to promote. So people said, look, you have to serve healthy food and eat healthy food if you're trying to get people excited about it. Um, so that, you know, during the breaks, don't everybody be going off and eating hot Cheetos for lunch. Um, you know, provide healthy food where you can so you can be getting people excited about this. And collaborate with other organizations in the community, um, developing networks, partnerships, and that way you can share resources and diverse perspectives and finding like-minded people to collaborate with is seen as important. And then be flexible and creative and learn as you go and beautify your space. So Christina at Mushkiki Gittagam was convinced that the reason why people didn't vandalize it there, even though they didn't have fences, was because they worked hard to incorporate a lot of art by the youth into the space. And then some financial advice, um, some of the, because these were uh, community-based projects, a lot of them were nonprofits or run similarly. Um, people advise, you know, looking to private foundations as well as government grants, because it can be very hard to get those government grants. Um, but also recognizing that a lot of projects can't be funded entirely through grants forever. So figuring out economic development as an aspect of it, um, building up your market, show people how to cook the food you want them to buy from you. And these are just some of the different foundations that people have. Um, looked to for these kinds of funding. Oh, I don't know why that was. There's the blog that just popped up instead of my next slide. Um, so I think I'm running out of time. I'll try to wrap up here. Um, some advice on vis vision and balance. You know, just do it. Get some seeds in the ground. Some people said, well, you know, you can't have meetings for 10 years. Um, people will judge you on what you do, not on what you say you do. So make sure to get some seeds in the ground. Um, but have a long range goal. Pick a goal to determine. You know, what you're going to plant, how much you're going to plant it, who you're going to plant it for. Um, and then longer range, be always keeping in mind, what will this project look like generations from now? So I included some of Lillian's fruit trees down here. She said, look, I planted all these fruit trees. Um, it's not going to be me who sees the benefit of this. It's going to be my kids and their kids who are really going to be excited about this lush orchard that will be here someday. And then my little bit of advice is signage. Don't take for granted that other people are aware of your garden, market, edible landscape, et cetera. There are so many places that people are like, oh, we planted these you know, blueberry bushes or elderberry bushes everywhere and nobody picks them. Um, but people don't always feel like they have permission to harvest or take part in things. So signage can be really helpful there. So just to wrap it up, um, I've kind of taken you on a whirlwind tour through some cool indigenous farm projects. Um, but thinking about how all of this can contribute to a sense of um, individual community and broader tribal community food sovereignty. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions after 
uh, Professor Mihisua goes and um, gives you some more specifics on how to do some of this gardening. Dr. Hoover, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, beautiful. And one of our audience members called it illuminating and encouraging, and I can think of no better words than that. Um, so I'm really excited to see uh, what the audience um, has to ask about that uh, after our next presentation, which will be by uh, Devin Mahisawa, um, who is an enrolled citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and the Cora Lee Beers Price Professor in the Humanities Program at the University of Kansas. She is the former editor of American Indian Quarterly and the University of Nebraska Pr Press book series, Contemporary Indigenous Issues. A historian by training, she is the author of numerous award-winning books on indigenous history and current issues, including American Indigenous Women, Ned Christie, Cherokee Her, Choctaw Crime and Punishment, and Recovering Our Ancestors' Gardens, which was recently named by Gourmand International as the best indigenous book in the US. Dr. Mahesawa, as if that's not enough, has also written five novels. Uh, she speaks nationally and internationally about issues pertaining to empowerment of indigenous peoples and has received awards from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Ford Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, American Educational Studies Association, and the American Historical Association, among other awards. At Northern Arizona University, she received the Native American Students United Award for Outstanding Faculty, the President's Award for Outstanding Faculty, and the Outstanding Faculty Woman of the Year Award. So uh, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Mahisawa. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. You know, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, you're not that far from where I live in um, Baldwin City, Kansas, if I would hop on I-70. Um, I think it'd take me three hours to get there. And it really is a beautiful place. I wish everybody could come see the, that area. And um, yeah, thank you very much, Elizabeth. That, that was good. And there's no question, you know, the indigenous food sovereignty is indeed very complicated. And I wanted to point out that in, our, in the book um, anthology that we did, we came up with a graphic. And, and in this graphic, we tried to include all the various components of indigenous food sovereignty. And I think if we were to revisit that now, we would probably add a lot more to it. So, but uh, you, you did a really, really good job there. So what I want to do, okay. um, what I wanted to do was just zoom in um, on some historical aspect. I was talking about, um, modern, you know, community gardens and tribal gardens. And what I'm also very interested in are uh, native backyard gardens. And so I'm going to focus on um, the five tribes that um, originally were in the southeast part of the United States and then were removed in the 1830s to Indian Territory, which is uh, today Oklahoma. And it just so happens that this is um, Hashaponi, which is the month of cooking. Um, among the Choctaws, we had a 13 month calendar. And so it's this time of year that we have to start picking what we, what we grew. So this means we, we dry, smoke, um, preserve, pickle. And so what I do, you know, in my yard, you know, before the first freeze, which is actually probably a couple more weeks, you know, I, you know, run out there and, you know, grab all the, the green tomatoes and everything that's just left in the garden and try to do as much as I can with it, you know, to preserve it. So I, I also wanted to mention that Thanksgiving week in 2021 is the 11th year of the um, annual week of Indigenous eating. I, I uh, run the Facebook page, Indigenous Eating. And what this is, it's just a challenge for people who are interested in indigenous foods, uh, native people who might want to learn about their traditional ways of eating to see how many foods that they can eat, you know, just in one week. You know, if they could possibly just have one meal a day, you know, that's, that's doing really well. But the whole idea is to educate yourself about what was it that your tribe or the tribe that you're interested in used to eat historically. And so I have, I think, 8,700 followers, and usually I get quite a few people that are interested in this. So if, if you want to do it, you know, just, just chime in. You're very welcome. So um, when we talk about, you know, backyard gardens, we can't really talk about backyard gardens without taking a look at, you know, traditional ways of agriculture. 
And there are there are a lot of drawings, a lot of paintings of, of tribal peoples who, you know, had fantastic, you know, farms. And many native people were cultivating, you know, vast amounts of produce, you know, particularly corn and squash. But from Florida, um, all the, you know, throughout the Northeast into the Southwest, you know, native people knew what they were doing um, when it came to growing things. You know, here, this was, this was a painting that was done um, in the Ohio Valley. And here they are scaring off the birds, getting them off the corn. Um, in what we see, okay, here we are, uh, the Wichita's, the Wichita's were also in Texas and the Wichita's were, um, they were very skilled agriculturalists so much so that a lot of tribes would raid them. Comanches, for example, <clears throat> they were not agriculturalists. So what they had to do was raid the tribes if they wanted food. So a prime target were, um, the Wichita's. This also includes wild rice, uh, the tribes from the Eastern woodlands. And there are an awful lot of photographs of Ojibwe's, you know, in Minnesota who do cultivate their wild rice. So if you are interested in that, you know, you can just Google, there's quite a bit that is written about it and, and they do sell their wild rice as well. Um, we can also hop down to Mexico. And here we have the Chinampas. And I like to include Central and South America too, because there was a vast trade network. And these are their, they called them floating gardens, but they weren't really floating gardens. Um, Lake Texcoco in the Valley of Mexico was at one time, you know, home to the Aztecs. And what they did was to dump soil in the middle of this lake and kept building it up until they so they built their city. And so surrounding the city, they had these gardens that they made. And these were very productive. And even today, people are attempting to um, recreate these chinampas. But unfortunately, you know, what we're seeing is tremendous water pollution, drought. And so it is, you know, it's a real challenge to try to recreate, you know, the ways that they ate traditionally. Going into the Southwest and Hopi farming, you know, as Elizabeth had pointed out, um, Hopis for millennia have practiced what's called dry farming. And over to the left, it looks almost like desert pavement, but my, it says my internet, internet connection is unstable. So I hope that I'm not quavering. That has happened before, but I'll, I'll proceed. But what is starting to happen upon Hopi Mesa are families who, who have been farming corn and other plants for hundreds of years have actually and they are now buying corn because it simply is just too much effort and there isn't enough moisture and of course this is the iconic Ansel Adams uh, photograph and the corn wasn't very high you know because it couldn't grow very high but you know for so so long for hundreds of years you know it was extremely um, productive okay this is the irrigation canals along the Salt River in Arizona. And this is very interesting because when you, you see all these lines, these, these lines that are going off of the Salt River, this wasn't to retain the water. You know, at one time that Salt River would fill and then it would overflow into those tributaries. And this, this is what they depended on, you know, to grow their crops there in the desert. And there are remnants of these irrigation ditches in the Southwest. I strongly recommend if you are interested in gardening to take a look at Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden. You know, this is a, well, it is a classic. And Buffalo Bird Woman, um, she was a Hidatsa woman who I think was born in 1837, and she gave testimony about how she and her tribe farmed in 1917. And so this little book is really just a little charming kind of gem that, that tells an old way of how to be a successful farming uh, farmer. So um, you can pick this up in a lot of places. So very quickly, what I want to do is talk about um, these five tribes and I want to make it clear that the tribe is necessarily like to be called, these tribes don't like to be called the five civilized tribes, okay? But this is the only picture I could find that had all their great seals on there. So we've got the Cherokees, Chickasaws, Choctaws, Muscogee Creeks, and the Seminoles. 
Originally, they lived in the southeast, and that's the yellow part over here. Um, and again, in the 1830s, they were removed to Indian Territory, courtesy of Andrew Jackson's uh, Indian removal policy. But this was a very lush environment, lots of waterways, lots of creeks and, and rivers, fruit vines, uh, trees, bushes, nuts and seeds, many, many game animals. And interestingly enough, these animals that they, that they subsisted on, you know, deer and squirrels and bears and rabbits, they also appear in Oklahoma. And I know they're in Missouri um, as well, and also Kansas out in my backyard, except for the bear. And uh, they also ate a lot of turkey. And um, just as a sidelight here, because, you know, students always find this amusing, you know, our traditional word for turkey is fuck it. But our tribal council and uh, some conservative Choctaws wanted to get rid of that word because of the way we, you know, phonetically pronounce it. So they want to go with a kakchaha, which means big chicken. Um, so there is a, some real pushback on this. And so now we have our fit shirts and our coffee mugs and other things like that. But anyway, you know, turkey, you know, turkeys were, you know, one of the mainstays and, and turkeys went into many of many of the dishes, catfish, mussels, um, alligators. So to look at these backyard gardens um, that really were the mainstay of, of their diets, the Muscogee Creeks, um, they, they had a large community garden. So everybody participated in in uh, cultivating this garden. So every morning um, during you know, cultivating season, a conch cell was, was blown and everybody was required to show up to cultivate this garden. And the crops that they grew is primarily corn and squash and melons and some beans. And this was used for trade and for ceremony. And the different types of corn, we had pop, flint, uh, dent and hominy corn. Uh, these are my these are my corn dogs, uh, Hank and Trixie. But they did not have the uh, sweet corn that that everybody's familiar with. And so this this kind of corn that you see here on the right, you know, you're not going to see that at the state fair. You don't coat that in butter and put cinnamon and sugar on it. I mean, maybe some people do. You know, this corn, you had to process it, you know, and it took a while to do it. And it was primarily ground up to make flour or it was put in soups or stews. Lots of squashes and pumpkins and melons, green beans, sunflowers. And one thing that, that these tribes did um, when they went out to gather things, they would dig things up and they would bring them back so that those would grow in their own gardens. They very quickly adopted European plants and African plants, you know, watermelon and black, they're absolute favorites, you know, so much that among the Scogie Creeks, if you were to ask them what are their traditional foods, one of the top things is black eyed peas. And, and they don't want to hear that that it was introduced, um, but okra and garlic, cabbage and leeks. The Choctaws also had large community gardens and they used that also for trade um, so that they would have adequate surplus in times of war um, or drought. And men and women shared the responsibilities. Everybody had a role to play. And the Chickasaws also, they had a common, ownership of land. So any citizen could work a field as long as they didn't encroach on their neighbor's property. And sometimes neighbors worked a field together, but alternatively, families had small gardens of corn and beans, you know, squash and melons right outside their homes. And these were called roasting ear patches, kitchen gardens, backyard gardens or Tam Fuller gardens. And Tam Fuller is a take on the word Tam Fula, which is a dish, traditional dish, it's corn mush. Um, but if you're from Oklahoma, you might say Tam Fuller. So that's, that's how we get the Tam Fuller, um, Tam Fuller. So if you're interested in how to make Tam Fuller, um, there's a variety of ways to do it. Um, I have the American Indian Health and Diet page. And unfortunately, KU has taken away my platform, so I can no longer add to it. And I'm going to have to figure out um, something new with it. But I do, I still have a very large uh, recipe section on there. So if you want, want to find things there. Um, 
The reason that these backyard gardens uh, were important is that these large community gardens might fail. The seeds might not be viable. There might have been a flood, drought, you know, insects or something. So if the large garden failed, the hope was that you could turn to getting seeds from these smaller gardens. Plus, families grew what they preferred to grow. So you had families who would specialize in a certain crop. So you always knew that you could depend on somebody um, or that you could exchange seeds with them. And this is probably a 1920s uh, photograph in Alabama of Muscogee Creek um, property. And you can see that they would grow their crops right up to the side of their house. You know, they, they just did not waste any space at all. The other thing that is very interesting, and I really like this a lot, is they didn't weed. And outsiders who, who came across these gardens, they believed that, oh, these weeds have taken over. Look at this. You know, it's such a mess. And the Choctaws did have smaller areas than the other tribes, but they produce more. And this is one reason why. Um, we, it depends on how you define weeds, right? You can eat a lot of weeds. A lot of weeds are extremely nutritious and they really aren't weeds at all. Goosefoot, which, which is actually an introduced plant, it really has taken over. And this, this appears in my garden galore and probably over there in Missouri too, I would imagine. Um, you didn't want to plow this up because in the process of getting rid of the weeds that you don't want, you're getting rid of the weeds that you do want and you can't eat. And this is goosefoot close up and you can see how it got its name. It sort of looks like a goosefoot. And here I'm just putting it into um, stir fry and it's, it's like spinach, you know, it just cooks down. And this is what it looks like in your garden. Um, up at the top, it's got a little white, dusting it looks like but you don't want to pull that you want to clip those leaves particularly the leaves that are very young because uh, it's more nutritious than spinach so what they were doing essentially was crowding their crops they grew corn with beans and sunflowers and pumpkins and melons and then they would bring back the plants that they found so they just have everything growing together so this idea of these beautiful nice neat rows just did not apply um, to a lot of these tribes. It just didn't happen that way. They just had too much going on and plants latching on to each other. It was just very productive. In the 1830s, as I mentioned before, they were removed from the Southeast to Indian Territory. And this map is for your test later. Remember all these little arrows, right? So here's Oklahoma, made the state in 1907. And you can see where the nations were, Cherokee, Choctaw Creek, Seminole, Chickasaw. And Oklahoma is, you know, Eastern Oklahoma, as some of y'all probably know, is just very, very lush and green, full of timber. It's really quite beautiful, more shoreline uh, than Minnesota. Once they got there in the 1830s, they didn't plant their community gardens any longer. And it didn't take very long before intruders came in and the animals and wild plants really diminished from, from over hunting. So families though, still had their knowledge about how to plant their backyard patches. So they were crucial to survival. And we, if we take a look at what's happening today and we see how expensive food is, I mean, the grocery store is kind of a shock um, every now and then, isn't it? Um, if you can grow some of the stuff yourself, you know, it, it is a great help. But back then, this was, this was the way that you survived. And one thing I just wanted to point out, this, um, this is the Three Sisters Garden. And of course, the Three Sisters Garden, the idea behind that was you have your corn stalk and then the pole beans, you know, wrap around the corn stalk. And then you have the big sow to keep the soil moist. Um, you know, to give nitrogen to the soil, you know, when the leaves deteriorate. But not every tribe, I'm unstable again, so to speak, no jokes. Um, uh, not every tribe grew three sisters in that symbiotic fashion. A lot of tribes did grow corn, squash, and beans, but not like this. Um, the three sisters is actually a Northeastern um, concept, just to throw that in. So here is another picture of an Oklahoma garden. And I think these are freedmen, all the, you know, the tribes did have freedmen. And so after the Civil War, you know, the freedmen also had their patches of land. And so they were doing the same things. 
So here is a Muscogee Creek man, and he is making sofki. And sofki is a, a mush, a corn mush meal. But what they did, they used a, um, a tree stump and they got burning coals and they would put that at the top of the stump and they would add more coals until they made a, a deep divot, you know, in the stump. And then they had their pole and then they, that, this is how they, this is how they ground the corn. And here's some women doing it. And there's some testimonies from people in the 1930s um, through the workers uh, progress administration administration. They were in their eighties and nineties and they commented that we just hit that corn and ground it and ground it until we thought our arms were going to fall off. So, so it wasn't easy, you know, it was a, it was a long process. So here, here's some pictures of the things that, um, Choctaws, uh, Choctaws had, because I'm, I'm speaking from my tribe, you know, in particular, but these are things that I found around my house. And I, again, I live in um, Baldwin City, Kansas, and so I can gather this stuff. And so what I try to do is bring things home and then plant it in my yard. So we got pokeweed over on the left, and here's mulberries and wild garlic and wild onions, American persimmons and black walnuts and uh, wild plums. And it won't be long before the American persimmons are ready. And I'm betting that y'all probably have those over your way too. They're best after the, the first frost. They look terrible, but that's when they, they taste the best. Pawpaws, this is uh, pawpaw season. And I'm very excited about this. You know, I went running this morning and I stopped and I found pawpaws and I ate them and I got all messy and sticky. But, you know, there's a very short window of time to have pawpaws and pawpaws are the largest fruit in the United States or in North America. And they are shaped like a baked potato and you cut them open and they have enormous seeds. And the, the um, flesh is similar to a custardy kind of banana mango type flavor. And this is, this was the range of pawpaws. So they don't go all over the country, but it's my understanding that in some of these places, they're not doing so well because of drought and um, global warming. So here, last week, I took a picture here, I stopped and ate one. And then the other day, I made um, blue corn pancakes with um, pawpaw mush on top. So these backyard gardens were very important. And, you know, in 1830s, you know, one, one Cherokee said, no self-respecting Cherokee would ever be without a corn patch. And a Choctaw, you know, said, we never ate flour, it doesn't taste right. So even up to the 1930s and beyond, you know, these gardens are very, very, very important. And during the Great Depression, you know, many Many tribes were able to thrive because this is what they were used to doing. They were used to growing their own food. They were used to being impoverished. So many of them were able to just make it right through. And in fact, there's a lot of stories of um, some tribes having to help their white neighbors, you know, who weren't so fortunate because they didn't know really how to grow anything. Gardens are also legacies. You know, the first novel that I wrote, God, now it's what twenty something years ago. Um, this is seven generations of you know my my family stories, and one of the overarching themes in there was this family garden. You know, this garden would just replicate itself because it was passed down, you know, through the generations. And so I, I really had a lot of joy in you know being able to write about that. And that's me, my little Chabot self. I think it was two and a half or something. And that's my Irish grandpa, my my grandmother's Choctaw, but. I mean, he was Irish, she was Choctaw. And this is their garden in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And see how tall that corn is. And so what I've tried to do is to take that garden where I live. Um, but I don't know, he, he really had a green thumb and I, his soil was better, I think. That's, that's my excuse. So when we lived in um, Flagstaff, Arizona, um, I had a garden there and we lived in the... Um, area and so it was kind of volcanic ash that's why there's so many rocks there and the elk could jump that fence you know and then we made it higher they were still jumping over the seven and eight foot fence but and so the zucchinis always did very well so these are just some pictures I'm going to go through here rapid fire um so this is this is my big garden when I decided to do raised beds 
And this is my garden last year, um, probably midsummer. This is what I mean by kind of letting it go. There's raspberries and corn and tomatoes and peppers and beans wrapping themselves all over everything. And the first time I did this, I felt very guilty. I thought, my God, this looks terrible. I don't want anybody seeing this. But there was so much stuff in the garden that that now I find that this this really does work very well, just to kind of let it let it take off. And so these are some raised beds outside the back door. And the reason that I'm showing these pictures to you is, you know, I, I'm assuming that y'all are watching this because you're interested in, in growing things and you're interested in native foods. And maybe you, you want to, to, to have a bigger garden and in yard. And I'm here to say you can do it. You can grow a lot of things in a very small area. So, you know, here's a raised bed I did with a bunch of greens and I use a lot of pots, you know, container gardening, you know, you can be very successful at that. That's, there's my daughter when she was younger, the gourd, the gourd arch and uh, my little dinky greenhouse. And you can do a lot with a little dinky greenhouse. So I'm very glad that I have that amaranth. Once you get amaranth going, this is amaranth right here. Um, it just comes back every year. And now I feel like I look out in the backyard, it looks like a field of, of amaranth. It's almost um, a bit too much. So raspberries and sunflowers and carrots and peppers. And then of course you, you get going. And when you have a successful year, you have a successful year. And so what are you going to do for the rest of the year? Well, you need to dry it and freeze it and, you know, make sauces and things. And this is my dream greenhouse at Baker University, which is right down the road. So this is some of the things that I do this time of year. You know, a lot of pickling, a lot of drying. Those are tomatoes. Um, and then I get them very dry. And I do the same thing to peppers and I make powder out of it and sauces. And, uh, you know, Elizabeth also, you know, mentioned this about, you know, it isn't just about people, you know, it's all about the animals as well. And so I always make sure that I've got the pollinator garden going because without them, you know, nothing is going to grow, right? So if you're going to be a gardener, you need to make sure that you are also planting things that, that they like. Um, my book, Recovering Our Ancestors' Gardens, first came out in 2005, and I revised it by about 70%. And that just came out um, this last year. And so there's a curriculum guide in this for those of you that are educators. And then I also expanded and there's a section on you know, getting started with, with gardening. And there's embedded readers in there about many of the things that, that both of us just, just talked about. So I'm going to stop there because I think I, I, I went over. So yeah, so if anybody has questions. Dr. Mahisawa, thank you so much for that presentation. I, I really appreciate it about both of these presentations we've heard in the last hour, the specific action points and curricula and recommendations and recipes that we've taken away. Um, I think there are gonna be a lot of great questions, but before I uh, hand things over to the Q&A moderators, I just wanted to put in a plug for tomorrow's event where we'll have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Hoover uh, back again, along with Dr. Tiffany Hardbarger. Um, this is hosted by uh, SIUE and will be at noon tomorrow, Sunday, October 10, on indigenous foods and sustainability. Um, so now I wanna hand things over to uh, Ashley Glenn, who's here at the garden with me, also a member of the William L. Brown Center, and Alex Morales Heil, who's at the Washington University in St. Louis Climate Change Program. Thank you, Robbie. Yes, we do have some great questions. Um, first, from Jara County, Australia. Uh, they say, I am loving starting my morning with this pair of presentations. Thank you to both presenters. The imagery and narrative you are sharing is energy giving. To revisit some of the material in the presentation, is it best to order the co-authored book or are there other recent publications I should look for? And I know that Elizabeth answered this directly in the chat, but uh, I would like her to share it with uh, our wider audience. I just mentioned that, yes, the, the co-edited volume is a great place to start. 
Um, and also the the book that Devin mentioned, the um, Ancestors Garden book, is a great one. Any of the editions, but especially the the new and updated one. Great, thank you. I I wanted to mention that you know when when Elizabeth and I were talking about this book, you know, we really wanted to include so much more. You know, we were constrained by page numbers. <laughs> you know, it could only be so long. So, you know, it really would have been wonderful if it was a thousand pages long so we could include something from, you know, different tribes and, you know, and have more topics. But there was only so much that we could do. But I like to think that the, the bibliographies or references, you know, within those chapters would help people, you know, direct them, you know, to, to other things they might be interested in. And then also our colleague in Canada, Priscilla Seti, did a similar edited volume um, featuring First Nations authors. So if people are um, interested in our Cousins to the North as well, that's another edited volume to look into. There are, there are a lot of very short YouTube videos now. It's almost overwhelming, you know, what is out there on the web. Um, and, you know, if, if you're interested in one topic, I would definitely look it up and look at the videos. They're little how-to videos, but short, short snippets of history, interviews, blogs. It's really one of these things where once you get started, it just goes on and on. And, you know, thinking back just, what, 10, 15 years ago, it just wasn't there. So it really has exploded. And there, there's just an enormous amount of inspiration you know, for anybody who's looking for that and an awful lot of advice as well. Yeah, I think because a lot of our food summits, um, all the in-person stuff got canceled, things got pushed online. So the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance um, and the Intertribal Ag Council have collaborated on some of these food summits and, you know, recorded events kind of one at a time and, and put them up online. So those are other organizations that people can look to specifically. And then Mariah Gladstone has Indigi Kitchen and she's done videos on how to cook. So there are also, you, know, you can garden, but then if you're interested in the, the processing end that Devin mentioned at the end of her talk as well. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have a great question um, from Katja Kopp um, asking how, how can a, nat a non-native gardener support native people's food sovereignty? I mean, I would say there are some projects in which um, some of the, and I didn't really get too much into seeds. So I'm going to talk about that a little more tomorrow um, in the follow-up talk that I'm giving. Um, but there have been native farm, um, non-native farmers and landowners who have helped to grow out seed in some cases. So, you know, for example, with the the Pawnee seeds that Electa spoke about a few days ago, um, her community partnered with non-native farmers in Nebraska. Um, similarly, people from Akwazesne have partnered with the Hudson Valley Farm Hub and Seed Shed to grow out seeds there. Um, here in California, I'm working on a presentation with the Amamutsan Land Trust um, and Pi Ranch for farmers who will be attending the EcoFarm Conference about um, getting farmers to recognize that your land is on someone's homeland and how can you potentially partner with members of that community in the stewarding of this land. Um, so for, for Pi Ranch, they've partnered with the Amamutsan Land Trust to develop specific gardens and programs there for the Amamutsan people who are ostensibly landless. They don't own land as a tribal community. Um, so thinking about how other farmers and landowners can potentially partner with local tribal communities to, to grow out things that they may need grown out. Elizabeth, can people donate to those various organizations because the organizations, don't they give grants and financial assistance to native people? Yeah, so I mean, the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance has a, a donate button and um, you know provides a lot of programming and seeds to native communities so that's a, a great point devon you know the aquazesne freedom school is always happy to receive donations um and they they are a completely self-sufficient self-sustaining school um so they really you know can always use 
donations to, to help with the programming there for the, the Akwazasni youth. So those are two examples of places people can send donations to. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Emily. Uh, they say, thank you to both speakers. I recently read Dr. Hoover's The River is in Us for an environmental justice class and couldn't put it down. So it is great to hear from her here. Uh, I am a student at Swarthmore College, they say, and I am currently working on a project to educate youth and start a community garden in a minority community fighting environmental racism. And this is in Chester, Pennsylvania. Do you have any advice for how to have a successful project as an outsider who is not from this community? And I've seen this a lot. Um, there are oftentimes people who have a lot of energy and good intentions and excitement um, who really want to spearhead these kind of projects and they want to help communities with all of this energy and excitement. And the only way that it will last beyond your time there, and that's the only challenging thing about being a college student. Well, no, there's a lot of challenging things about being a college student, but you're in college for four years. Um, and maybe if you stay on for graduate school, it could be longer. Um, but there's a good chance that you're going to move probably after the end of those four years. And so unless you want that project to sort of dry up and wither away the minute that you graduate and move on, it's really important that as you're developing it, you're working collaboratively with people from the community, that the ideas for how to get this garden going, for what to plant, how to design it, um, how to get youth involved are really coming from community members who are still going to be there after you graduate. Because if you come in and you pour your heart and soul in there and you put all this effort in, um, and you're the real energy and the motivation behind it, as soon as you leave, it's not going to have legs of its own. So my advice would really be to make sure that um, you're not the leader, that you're um, working alongside other people who will be able to carry that on successfully after you graduate and perhaps go on to another community. I see this question from Julie Zimmerman. <laughs> do you want me to answer that? <laughs> yeah, do you, I can go ahead. I get, and oh, or, I get very excited about those things. Okay. So that everybody can, can go ahead and hear. Um, so Julie is asking specifically, Dr. Uh, Mahesua, sorry, um, what do you do about those vine borers and also squash <laughs> bugs? Um, and then also, how do you eat amaranth? Oh, man. If you only knew what I was thinking about those little squash borers and squash bugs. Oh my God. Okay. Well, there are some places around here that don't have them at all. And I am so jealous. And I, I ask, so do you, do you spray? What do you do? And they don't do anything. They don't have them. And I don't understand because they're only a few miles down the road, but I've lived here now for 16 years and I will have the most beautiful squash and overnight it's just, you know, it's just wilted. It's gone. So what, what I started doing, and th there really is only one way that you can attack these things. The borers, you know, are insidious. And for people who don't know, the borers get into the vine of the squash at the base, sometimes below the dirt. And they get in, and then they eat the inside, and then it kills, it can kill your plant. So what I had started doing once the plant gets to be a substantial size is I dig down in the dirt and I spray it good with neem oil, N-E-E-M, and then I sprinkle with diametaceous earth and then I get uh, duct tape. <laughs> I wrap it around sometimes five inches up and then I cover it back up. And then I have to be just very religious about spraying it with neem oil after it rains or something and then diametaceous earth. And that works really well. The problem is if it rains, you know, and then you got to start all over again. And then if you go out of town, then they, they got you. So this is sort of a daily thing. Now those little squash bugs, you know, that just crawl all over the place. You can just go out there and do this, right? You um, but, but what you also can do is get cardboard and lay it down, big pieces of cardboard at the base of your squash, because they like to get under wood and cardboard. And that's a way to kind of trap them. But then you lift it up and they scatter. 
So you kind of have to be ready to either smash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Smash or spray. Um, and I'm sure there's other, you know, folk <laughs> remedies for this. But the other thing that I had heard is if you live by soybean fields, that somehow that attracts the squash bugs and then they will hop from there um, to your squash. Soy to squash. I don't know if that is true or not, but I live in Kansas and I'm surrounded by soy. So that might, that might be it. And then as far as the amaranth goes, well, there's several things you can do. You know, amaranth is also known as pigweed. So when it's very young, uh, you can cut the, cut the leaves and you can just cook that up like, like spinach. But then once it matures and, you know, it's old enough that you can shake the seeds out, that itself is a long process. I recommend that you Google that to look it up. But what I do is I cut the heads off, you know, the big, beautiful, you know, flowery looking part, and I put it in mesh bags. And then I hang those up until it's very, very dry. And then I beat it, you know, and then all the black seeds fall to the bottom along with some of the chaff. Then you've got to put that in a bowl and then you've got to blow the, the chaff out. So again, it's, it's kind of a process, but, but then once you do, once you get down to the, the black seeds or, and sometimes they're brown seeds, if you get the wild pigweed, you put it in a very hot skillet with no oil until it pops. Yeah. And then you can put that into cereal or make little candies out of it, um, add it to whatever you want. But again, there are some educational videos about that. Um, but I do have a greenhouse full of bags of, of drying amaranth heads right now. So I look forward to digging into that. I appreciate such a thorough answer, especially about the squash borers, which is the age old question. Um, we, have a, we have a question from Jose who is an MLA student at Wash U uh, here locally. And they're interested in maximizing the yields of indigenous farmers in Mexico and other places throughout that may have been exploited by structures, structures such as NAFTA. These communities depend on growing maize on up and other crops, but industrial competitions make them obsolete. Do you think there is a place for designers to make an impact? I mean, I think oh, they become obsolete when all corn is seen as the same. And I think, you know, for all of this industrial corn being grown, you know, the average American thinks corn, they think of the, the white and yellow sweet corn in the grocery store and maybe like cornmeal. And those are kind of, and not realizing the corn is in absolutely everything. Um, but when you look at the different heirloom varieties, especially, you know, Mexico is the motherland of all of these corn and you see all these amazing, beautiful colors and the beautiful tortillas that can be made out of all of these different kinds. Um, I think it's only when people recognize the value of those individual varieties um, and the beautiful foods that can be made out of those individual varieties. So I think, you know, this is in some cases where, um, people can help in the marketing of that sometimes um, if people are looking to, to, to bring that out of there, if growers are looking to send it out of the country. Um, but I had the chance to, to visit the International Indigenous Corn Conference in Vicente Guerrero a few years ago that was hosted by the um, Intertribal Indian Treaty Council and go to one of these kind of corn fairs where people are trading. And I've never seen so many colors and shapes and varieties of corn in my life. And it was really beautiful and seeing all of the different food varieties that come out of that. Um, and industrial corn just can't compete with that, that, you know, all of the, the different corn that's sort of being pitched in these different ways. Um, you know, the, it's going into our gas tanks and it's going into um, corn plastics and corn syrups and everything else. And so it's in the recognition of the values of those um, beautiful flavors and colors and raising awareness about the utility of that, I think. Um, so we have another question. Um, this one comes from Greg Fields. And Greg is curious, um, what's happening in the Midwest near us in St. Louis um, in terms of Native food initiatives? Uh, 
I mean, I don't know about St. Louis specifically, but Minnesota um, and Wisconsin, there's a lot going on there as far as different um, food sovereignty projects. I think there's really kind of a hotbed of, you know, that's where a lot of the, the urban gardens that I visited were in Minneapolis. Um, you know, a lot of the, the tribal communities in the, the Midwest, there's the Upper Midwest Seed Keepers Alliance kind of started there. And then, you know, the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network came out of that. Um, because there's a concentration, I think, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. I don't know too much about what might be happening in St. Louis. I think Devin might have more experience in that region. Well, I really don't know. There really isn't anything going on in Kansas. I think that there are some individual gardens here and there, but no large um, initiative that I'm aware of. And I can point to our first event from this conference, which was interviewing um, some small garden projects with Native Americans and Native food in St. Louis, um, which is recorded and available for rewatching. Um, so I'll ask another question from Greg. In your work with no North American Native food projects, do you find much collaboration between indigenous efforts uh, around the world? Um, Clayton Brockope with the Traditional Native American Farmers Association has been collaborating folks with Belize for several years. And so I had the opportunity to go visit corn farmers in Belize with him and with some of the other um, tribal folks from Canada and the U.S. who had done his permaculture course. So I've, I've seen a, a kind of growing network between farmers to the south of us um, through that kind of invented imposed border um, with indigenous communities there and in the US and Canada. Um, New Zealand has an interesting and growing food sovereignty movement. And so some people have kind of been working across those borders and collaborati collaboratively with Maori um, people there farming their traditional crops. I think those are some ways. Um, there's the uh, indigenous Terra Madre. So you, know, you have Slow Food International, we've developed Slow Food Turtle Island um, as an association for indigenous people kind of across the Western hemisphere, but there's a broader indigenous Terra Madre network that um, representatives from Slow Food Turtle Island, like uh, Denisa Livingston, who's a Dene Navajo food producer, ally activist um, has been part of in that sense. So there's, and it, there's been a kind of growing attempt to connect indigenous people you know, around the world who are food producers, who are suffering from a lot of the same um, types of issues um, as people in settler colonial countries um, and looking to support each other in these ways. Thank you. Um, I've got a question. Um, from Kelly Thompson. Um, and first, she just says, thank you so much for your amazing presentations. Um, and she's curious if you can um, comment on how tribal resources or lack of resources um, affect tribal communities' ability to advance food sovereignty in their communities and with their people. Yeah, I mean, um, to have food sovereignty takes land. And so for some communities who um, are you know, have greater land resources, that makes it easier to work toward food sovereignty. Some communities lost a lot of land, but through um, like casino revenue have used that to try to buy back land and establish community farms and gardens in that way um, and to fund different food projects. So like the, um, the Shakopee community in Minnesota or the uh, Wisconsin Oneida, have worked to reacquire land and invest some of the money they're making in food producing um, infrastructure and with individuals. So, you know, there are, um, and then, you know, it depends on how you're thinking of resources because cultural resources. So people who've been able to maintain that kind of um, important knowledge and seed collections, even if their community is not financially wealthy um, those resources have been important to advance food sovereignty as well. Yeah, I would, I would take that um, a few steps farther. You know, not every tribe was an agricultural tribe, so they don't have an agricultural tradition, you know, to recover. 
And so oftentimes, you know, some, some tribes, you know, there isn't a whole lot of motivation, you know, and they don't really want to eat anything besides what they're eating right now, because they're just not interested in healthy eating. You know, my husband is um, Comanche, and they were, you know, nomadic, you know, raiders. And, you know, primarily they were hunters and they didn't grow anything. They didn't even have small gardens. And so they have no food initiative at all. And anybody who's attempted, you know, to try it, you know, it kind of gets shot down because a lot of people just aren't interested in in doing that. And um, I, I think also, you know, this gets to be very political, but even with my tribe that, you know, last year was worth, you know, over $2 billion, you know, we still have 10 and a half counties, you know, within the Choctaw Nation, and two of those counties are among the poorest in the United States. And so the question is, where is all this money going? And why aren't we doing something about our incredibly bad health? You know, uh, the state of Oklahoma really suffers, you know, just in general, um, from food related illnesses and, uh, and things that could be prevented, you know, but, you know, my tribe just, you know, insists on building more diabetes clinics without really addressing the root of the problem. You know, why do we have this to begin with? So I think it's not only, you know, the issues that Elizabeth mentioned, but it's also um, what is it that the people want and who, who is the leadership and what are their goals at the time? Because they may have something completely different in mind and they're not interested in food, food initiatives. I mean, I've seen that over and over again, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, we have a question from India from Muru Ganandam asks, uh, is there changes, shifts in indigenous food and gardening over years amongst traditional communities? With a lot of the knowledge explosion and sharing, uh, would it be for good or, or weakening the indigenous food systems? And I know you both addressed quite a bit of that in your talk about the changes that have been happening, um, but, but where do you see future progression projections on strengthening uh, indigenous food systems with all of these obstacles to overcome in the future? I think there's been a lot of sharing, a lot of learning. You know, I think it's important that people know, you know, their traditional food ways because that's a part of being culturally connected. But I think the, you know, one of the good things is that tribes are reaching out and they're growing, growing things that other tribes grew, you know, like the three sisters, you know, that that is an excellent way to grow corn, squash, and beans, even though not everybody did it. So just the practicality of adopting, you know, other tribe seeds and ways of doing things, a concern that I have, because I see, okay, the second part of that question is a lot of our tribal land, you know, the resources are diminishing, you know, for a variety of reasons, you know, whether it's, you know, global warming, climate change, encroachment, people come in and snitch it, you know, whatever. So, you know, there is concern about how are we going to retain the resources that are specific to, you know, a certain culture. And so that might be a problem because more, the more that people know about indigenous food ways, the more they're, they're curious about it and the more they want it. And just how much is there to go around for outsiders when, you know, this probably should be reserved for the, for the people right there. So that's only part, part of an answer to that, I think. Um, so I have a question that's coming in um, from Parul uh, Bakshi, and excuse me if I uh, didn't pronounce that correctly, um, but they say that they're an Im immigrant from India and a foodie and was surprised how hard it is to find um, Native American foods to discover um, and is curious about how, how we can improve that. Um, and then also um, wanted to ask if there are conversations with organizations um, such as uh, Nav Navdaya in India, which is um, Vadana Shiva's NGO to maintain grain diversity um, and challenge industrial monocultures and GMOs. 
I mean, when it comes to, um, you know, finding Native American food, if you're eating corn or beans or squash or tomatoes or pumpkins or peppers or, um, you know, any number of chocolate, you know, those are all foods indigenous to the Western hemisphere that have kind of then spread to the rest of the world. Um, so I think a lot of times people are eating Native American foods, cranberries, um, without necessarily realizing it. Um, if you're looking for like a Native American restaurant or caterer, that gets a little more challenging. Um, but, you know, we're lucky that some new ones are opening up. So Sean Sherman's restaurant just opened in Minneapolis, Awamni. Um, Crystal Wapapa out here in California is about to open her restaurant um, any minute now, Wapapa's Kitchen. Um, you also have the Ohlone Cafe guys that are about to open up here um, also in California. So, um, and if you're in the Denver area, Ben Jacobs has his restaurant there, um, Tokabe. And then uh, if you're heading up in the kind of area near Six Nations or around Toronto, you got to go see Tanya Brandt and her Yuego Foods. So people are starting. It's very hard to get a restaurant going, and um, but people are working really hard to try to establish some of these Native restaurants. Um, and in the meantime, you know, wild rice is a great uh, Native food to, to start with as well. Yeah, I would agree, you know, and a, and a lot of people think they need to have something super fancy when, when in reality, you know, you look at the way that tribes traditionally prepared things, you know, where they roasted it or boiled it or just ate it raw, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, something super duper. So if you're interested in native foods, you know, do you, on my um, indigenous food and health page, there's a link to a long list of foods indigenous to this hemisphere. And, you know, you could go down that list and you probably have already had a lot of those things. You, you just, you know, like Elizabeth said, you probably just weren't aware of it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, this fantastic plate either. You know, you could just eat some sunflower seeds, <laughs> basically. I mean, being honest, you know, and, and historically when people were hungry, you know, boy, they just, they ate, what, what was there and what was at hand, you know, and that has changed over time, of course. So, Thank you. I have a question um, myself as an academic who uh, works with food and plants. Um, I imagine there's a lot of academics in the audience as well. And uh, we're all here because we care about these values that you both are working towards. What would be your call to action for institutions, museums, universities um, to support this type of work? Thank you. Okay, you want me to go? <laughs> I would say that there just really needs to be education about taking care of the natural world. And I think that everybody needs to be educated about that um, because if we don't take care of the planet and have clean water and air and make sure that everybody is treated equally and everybody has access, you know, to, to clean, to, you know, to, to clean water and, to be able to have nutritious foods, uh, you know, nobody's going to survive. So, so yeah, I, I, it would be lovely if everybody had to take a class, you know, on indigenous history and culture and indigenous food ways, but that just isn't going to happen. Um, I think it needs to be more education about how can we all be good stewards and how are we all going to take care of the planet, but also how are we going to be good to each other? And I'm not really sure how we go about doing that. The way that the universities are whacking programs and the way the universities are limiting things that we can do and board of regents are being very sticklers about critical race theory and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's, it's more challenging all the time. And I think maybe this really does need to start with grade school. Well, actually it needs to start at home, you know, but how are parents going to to know this, you know, you would hope that that parents and communities and tribes would have um, educational programs and ways to educate their own members so that we start that way. And then it gets into the school systems, but it, it really just needs to be where everybody is on the same page. Otherwise it just, 
<laughs> we're going to keep on going the way we're going, I think. That's not easy to answer. That's a emotional question and answer, I think. I don't know. There's a lot of ways to answer that. I, think. I mean, I think universities can um, ensure that students are learning about community-based research protocols and how to appropriately approach communities to conduct research alongside um, making sure that when people are carrying out research projects that they are useful for the communities that people are working with. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this tomorrow, but thinking about how can, you know, in collections, how can those collections be made uh, more open to Indigenous communities that might be interested in coming to, to visit their seed relatives or other uh, resources mm -hmm. that have been kind of um, maybe put on shelves and not had the opportunity to have a lot of human interaction. That's a wonderful yeah. point to in with. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoover and Dr. Mahisua for these insightful and inspiring presentations. And to Ashley and Alex for your eloquent moderation. Thank you also to the audience. If you have a moment, please share your thoughts on the presentation through the survey. You'll find a link in the chat window. And if you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did, please join us tomorrow at the talk by Dr. Hoover and Dr. Tiffany Hardbarger. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone there. And thank you again. Thank you for the invitation. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you.